Assalamu alaikum students, welcome back to the online classes of Islamiyat. Uh, a few minutes back, I was discussing with you the teachings of Islam about jihad. And I told you in the introduction that there are three types of jihad, spiritual jihad, mental jihad, and then physical jihad. And in the last session, we have covered uh, a talk about a spiritual and mental jihad. And in, in this session, I will discuss with you the teachings of Islam about physical jihad. First of all, we have to define that what physical jihad means. You will say that physical jihad refers to the armed struggle in the way of Allah to spread the goodness and to, sh and, uh, to uh, defend Muslims or to remove the hurdles from the peaceful propagation of Islam. There are two purposes of physical jihad. One is to defend Muslims and Islamic states and Islamic communities. And secondly, to remove hurdles from the peaceful propagation of Islam. The first purpose, the first meaning of physical jihad is very obvious and there is no debate in it. Everyone understands it and believes it, accepts it, that if Muslims will be attacked, so Muslims will fight back in their defense and that is their jihad. There is no doubt about it that it's physical jihad. But only fighting in the self-defense is not the only physical jihad. It's not the only way of physical jihad. Otherwise, physical jihad would not be a big thing then. There are huge rewards promised for physical jihad. We will discuss it later in the end of this uh, discussion. So why Allah is giving huge rewards for that? Like there is a hadith in which uh, the Holy Prophet said, one day or one night in the way of Allah is better than this world and the things in it. Self-defense is not a big deal. Everyone does it because everyone loves his life. So everyone tries to protect it. Even the non-Muslims are there for their self-defense. They are more equipped than as for their, uh, their uh, self-defense. Even an animal, if you will attack an animal, the animal will also try something to defend his life, to protect himself. So physical jihad is not the only way of, uh, uh, self-defense is not the only way of physical jihad, but the main idea behind physical jihad is that the entire land belongs to Allah and the law of Allah has to be implemented on this land. That is the main idea behind physical jihad. Allah is the creator of the entire world. So Allah is the supreme authority. His law has to be implemented in the entire world. And who is responsible for it? The responsibility was originally given to the whole mankind. We have discussed it in Surah Al-Baqarah that uh, Allah sent down Adam alayhi salam and his descendant as his Khalifa on earth. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً And what is the meaning of Khalifa? What is the meaning of Allah's representative? That we are responsible to implement the law of Allah here and we are responsible to implement the law of Allah on ourselves and in the entire world. We have to struggle for it. And we are going to answer about it. We are answerable about it. As the president can ask the governor, that what is the condition of the law and order in your province and he is answerable about it. So similarly Allah is going to ask us on the judgment day that I send you down on earth as my representative, as my vicegerent and I gave you the responsibility to implement my book on earth. What struggles you meet for me? We are answerable about it. So that is the meaning, that is the main idea behind it. That the entire land belongs to Allah and Allah's law has to be implemented. But we see that many of the people amongst mankind are following wrong path. Even their basic beliefs are not correct. So now the responsibility comes on the true believers that they have to struggle for the deen of Allah, for the implementation of the law of Allah. There are agents of shaitan among the people, Quran calls them Hizb shaitan There are people who are the agents of Allah, the Holy Quran calls them Hizbullah. So we have to work for Allah's religion, we have to fight against the evil forces for the implementation 
of the law of Allah, doing a struggle for that is called physical jihad and that is something great. A person has no problem in his life but even then he is going out and he is in the battlefield and he is risking his life and he is spending his wealth and his energies and he is away from his family just for the sake of Allah's religion so that the religion of Allah will be implemented in the entire world so that the maximum people in the world will get the benefit of the word of God so that is something great. For example, take the example of Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid was the son of the richest man in Makkah. He was the son of Walid bin Mughira. He accepted Islam. He became a companion of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So Khalid bin Walid could stay in Makkah. He was a companion of the Prophet. He could do tawaf and umrah and hajj and he could offer tahajjud prayer. He was already a companion of the Prophet. But why Khalid bin Walid spent the entire life after his conversion in the battlefield and he participated in 115 battles all the time throughout his life he struggled in the physical jihad. What was the purpose behind it? The land of Allah is the land belongs to Allah so the law of Allah has to be implemented on it and just for the implementation of the law of Quran he made the struggles. He risked his life and he spent his wealth for that and he didn't give time to his business. That is something great and for such people Allah has promised huge rewards. So we should understand both the concepts over here that first of all jihad is done in order to defend the Muslim communities like Holy Prophet peace be upon him did. In the time of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him mostly the jihad, physical jihad was defensive because Muslims were very less in number and the enemies wanted to eradicate the Muslim community in Medina. In the battle of Fahad, in the battle of Trench, enemies were coming to destroy Medina. The Holy Prophet peace be upon him fought in the defense of Medina. That was purely a defensive jihad. But in the conquest of Makkah, you can say the Holy Prophet peace be upon him went from Medina to Makkah and he uh, destroyed all the idols and implemented the law of Allah in Makkah. That was uh, the jihad done for the implementation of the law of Allah. But during the caliphate period we see that it was not a defensive jihad. The jihad which was done by the companions of the holy prophet during the caliphate period especially that was not a defensive jihad but that jihad was carried out to implement the law of Allah in the entire world. Otherwise the companion could sit in Medina that if Medina will be attacked we will go out and fight but it didn't happen. The companions came out of the peninsula of Arabia. First the cleared the peninsula of Arabia from apostasy and then they went to Iraq, they conquered Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan and Armenia and they went in the west and they conquered uh, the entire Syria and then Egypt and Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco and they reached Spain. That was not self-defense, they were not fighting for defense but they were fighting for the deen of Allah that as long as we can go wherever we will see the land we will implement the law of Allah over there. It is said that uh, Uqba bin Nafir he put his horse into the water of the Mediterranean Sea and he said oh Allah I cannot see the land the water is here in my way otherwise I could go, go, could go further and I would struggle for the implementation of the law. So that is the main purpose behind physical jihad but nowadays as, as I discussed with you in my previous session that today we cannot be like that. We cannot go to the non-Muslim states today and we cannot give them the three options of Islam and jizya text or jihad because nowadays we cannot do this type of jihad uh, and today physical jihad is there for defense but originally what was the concept of jihad? I am telling you that concept. The main idea behind the concept of jihad was Allah ki zameen par Allah ka qanun. The entire land belongs to Allah. The law of Allah has to be implemented on it. That was the main idea behind jihad concept. The Holy Quran calls this jihad qital. Physical jihad is termed as qital in the Holy Quran. Qital means to kill someone and to be killed. Qatal karna, qatal hona, that is the literal meaning of qital. 
and Allah used this term in the Holy Quran in, uh, repeatedly. The first ayah in which Allah gave the permission of jihad, that was the verse of Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 39, in which Allah said, Uzina lilladheena yuqataluna bi annahum zulimu. Permission to fight is given to those who are fought against as they are wronged. Many of the students write down the first verse as uh, fight in the way of Allah, those who fight you. That is not the first verse about uh, the permission of jihad. This was the first ayah came about physical jihad. The wordings, it makes it clear that this is the first verse. Allah is saying permission to fight is given to those. And Allah has also mentioned the reason in it that why they are given this permission because they are wronged. They are treated with injustice. So it is their right to fight back. One more thing, this paragraph basically is all about the concept of physical jihad. In the next paragraph, we will discuss the way how to conduct it. But over here, I am just discussing with you what is the concept of physical jihad in Islam and why it is uh, carried out. So I am telling you that thing. In the Western countries, many of the people who are against Islam, they do propaganda against physical jihad. And they say that physical jihad in Islam means to kill the non-Muslims wherever you find them. And physical jihad refers to bloodshed in other words, that is propaganda against physical jihad. Physical jihad, as I told you, the concept behind it is the implementation of the law of Allah and the entire world as peacefully as possible. Bloodshed is done only in, the, in some cases where the resistance is there, otherwise not. The Holy Prophet we sway upon him and these people quote the verses from the, Quran, from the Holy Quran and they don't quote even the entire verse. And they don't tell the people in what context the Holy Quran has said this. But they take a phrase from the Holy Quran or a sentence from the Holy Quran and they start doing propaganda. For example, in Surah Tawbah, Allah said, فَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْسُ سَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ فَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْسُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. They just quote this much ayah and they say, look what the Holy Quran is saying. Kill them wherever you find them. What a dangerous book the Holy Quran is. What is the command given to Muslims that do the bloodshed of non-Muslims here you find? They don't discuss the entire scenario that in what circumstances the Holy Quran has given this command. About whom the Holy Quran is saying to kill them and in what circumstances to kill them. So they don't discuss the entire thing and they do propaganda by quoting a few words from this ayah. So we can we say to them that holy prophet we sway upon him is the founder of physical jihad he gave this teaching to his ummah so how much bloodshed the holy prophet we sway upon him did in his lifetime the holy prophet we sway upon him took uh, participation in 27 events related to jihad in some places the battle took place, in some places the battle didn't take place. But for 27 times, Holy Prophet, we swear upon him, did physical jihad. And the total number of casualties in those events is not uh, more than 1000. Total number of casualties, including Muslims and the non-Muslims, was not even uh, uh, around 1000. So, Holy Prophet, we sway upon him, got many uh, opportunities to do the bloodshed, but he never did it because this is not the purpose of physical jihad. We have studied the conquest of Makkah, how uh, Holy Prophet, we upon him, planned it. And Holy Prophet, we sway upon him, kept it secret that he was going to attack Makkahs just because they will do some preparation and then they will do some resistance and the bloodshed will take place. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, could, took his troops into the town. He had 10,000 troops with him. But Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't do that because in that case also the bloodshed could be done. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, asked his troops to stay outside Makkah and he did the campaign for the entire night and they showed the number of the people. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, asked each and every Sahabi to have a separate fire with some distance. And Holy Prophet say upon him wanted to show to the Makkans that we are coming with a huge army 
and you people cannot do the resistance so it is better to hand over the town peacefully holy prophet peace be upon him wanted to conquer makkah without shedding even a single drop of blood so holy prophet peace be upon him and islam and the quran never taught muslims to do unnecessary bloodshed that's a wrong propaganda which is done constantly uh, by the western media against islam and against the teachings of jihad in islam besides that in second paragraph that was a concept which i have discussed with you that what is physical jihad and what circumstances muslims do physical jihad what is the idea and concept behind it and it is nothing to do with the killing of the non muslims without reason but the companions during the lifetime of the holy prophet and during the time of the caliphate how they carried out physical jihad we have to mention that thing here is the companions whenever they used to go to some non muslim area first of all they used to invite the non muslims towards islam in a very knowledgeable way they used to invite them towards islam by giving them the logical arguments that to accept this deen it is better for you in this world and in akhirah this is the best guidance sent by god for mankind be connected with allah and take the benefit of this book in this world and in akhirah whatever the way is the best possible way they will use to convince the people to accept the deen of allah and if they will accept islam by their invitation that is the best thing that is the great success that no bloodshed has taken place and the deen of allah has implemented peacefully so they used to this is the first uh, option secondly if they will not accept islam because it is not easy for the people who followed some faith for the entire life it would be difficult for them to uh, accept islam to accept some new faith so quickly so it is possible they, that they will not like to accept islam in that case we don't force them the companions never force them to accept islam because the holy quran says la ikraha fi din let there be no compulsion in religion so we never forced muslims never forced the people to accept islam but they then they give them the second option the second option is the option of jizya tax companions of the holy prophet used to give them the second option to allow us to implement the law of allah in your land and according to that law you will be given all human rights you will be given the freedom of religion you will be protected by the muslim government your lives your honor and your properties will be protected by the muslims but you have to pay a reasonable amount of tax in return of all these services that's called jizya tax if they will accept this term so that will also be a very good way for the implementation in a peaceful way in this way peacefully without any fighting the law of allah will be implemented the message of islam will reach to each and every person and uh, no bloodshed is done in this way also but sometimes what happens that the people don't allow the implementation of the law of quran in any way they say that we don't allow the quranic law to be implemented and we don't know about the god and about messenger and about the book you are talking about so that we call hurdle because they are living in the land of allah they are enjoying the blessings of allah but they are denying the existence of god or the they are denying the authority of allah and they are creating hurdle in the implementation of the word of god on the land of god so that is called hurdle in that case only the companions used to say now the matter will be decided by sword and now the battle will take place and because they used to fight just for the sake of allah's religion so allah's help always came to them and the small armies defeated huge armies because of allah's help because they were not fighting to occupy their land they were not fighting for their own benefit they were fighting just for the sake of allah so in this way the physical jihad was carried out so we have to talk about these three options how do we have to go through these three options and when the battle will start when the, they will conduct the physical jihad there are uh, many restrictions mujahideen have to follow when they are conducting the physical jihad first of all they have to make sure that they are 
uh, fighting as long as the resistance is found. The moment they will stop the resistance, Mujahideen will stop using their weapons against them. There is a famous event that one Usama bin Zaid bin Harisa, the son of the adopted son of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Holy Prophet loved him like his grandsons, Usama bin Zaid bin Harisa. He killed a person who had surrendered. The companions informed Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, about that incident. So Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was angry with him and Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said, How can you kill a person who had already surrendered? So Usama bin Said said, Ya Rasulullah, he was fighting, but when he came under my sword, he started making these excuses that I want to accept Islam and I am surrendering. So Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said, How do you know the intention of that person? Allah Allah Did you open the heart of that person and you saw the intention of that person? How do you know? The moment he surrendered, you had to stop fighting against him. You had no right to kill him. Now the matter was between that person and Allah. What is there in his heart? We are no one to judge anyone. So Holy Prophet was not happy on that killing of that single person. According to the teachings of Islam, if we have killed thousands of non-Muslims, that is not a big success because they are all going to Jahannam. But if we have given guidance to them, if we have connected that person with Allah, that is a big achievement, that we have shown the path of Jannah to someone. So the purpose of jihad is to give guidance to the people, to bring them on the right path, implementation of the law of Allah, physical jihad never requires you to do unnecessary bloodshed of the non-Muslims. So when the physical jihad is being conducted, the Muslim warriors have to take care of these things. First of all, they will not kill anyone who is a non-combatant. The people who are not taking participation in fighting, they will not be killed. And mostly the people who don't take participation in the fighting, they are women, children and old people. So we don't have to kill them. It's a citizen is saying, I'm not fighting. I'm not taking part in this resistance. So we don't have to kill that person. Secondly, non uh, we will not uh, be cutting down the fruit bearing trees. We will not burn the fields because this is damage to the environment and Islam also teaches us environmental management. Islam does not allow to destroy the natural resources because uh, these trees and these fruits and these fields are blessings of Allah for us. Unnecessarily destroying them is not allowed. You know there is a surah in the Holy Quran in our syllabus, in our passage, uh, Surah Baqarah verse number 22 in which Allah has mentioned these resources. So, uh, our examiners relate that verse with the environment and they say that Quran has given the responsibility to humankind towards environment also. In which Allah says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْدَمَ فِرَاشَ وَجَعَلَ السَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ so In that verse, the Holy, in the Holy Quran, Allah has said that we, send, we made the earth, earth flat for you and we made the sky a canopy, we sent down the rain, we sent down the rain and we bring forth the crops for you. So uh, these are the blessings of Allah. So we have to take care of it and we don't have to cut down the trees and the fields in this way. Besides that we are not allowed to pull down the places of worship, the synagogues and the churches and the mandir and gurdwaras and whatever the places of worship belong to the non-Muslims. Muslim mujahideen are not allowed to pull them down and to destroy them. There is a principle under a standard that if there is a mosque, first of all on some plot mosque was built and then later the non-Muslims came and they destroyed the mosque or they converted in, into a church or into a mandir or something like that. So then Muslims have the right to re recover that uh, land and make it mosque again. For example, the Holy Kaaba. The Holy Kaaba was built by Ibrahim alayhi salam just for the worship of one and only God. And then later the people brought idols in it. So Holy Prophet peace be upon him came, destroyed all the idols, purified Kaaba from the dirt of idols. So that was right because it was originally a mosque. But if there is a plot on which the non-Muslims build their place of worship, Muslims are not allowed to convert it into masajid. 
and in Muslim history, it's uh, there are uh, rarely there are events where it was done. Muslims never converted their places into masajid because our religion doesn't allow us. But if you see in Spain, you cannot even realize by going to Spain that a Muslims ruled in that land for 800 years. They converted all masajid into churches. But our religion does not allow to make the place of worship of which belong to some other religion. Don't convert it into masjid. If you don't want masjid, uh, if, you, if you want some masjid, you can build it on a separate place. Besides that, Mujahideen will not kill the religious leaders who are living and who are there in the places of worship and they are busy in their ibadah. They will not be killed because they are not taking part in the resistance. Similarly, mutilation of the dead bodies is not allowed. You know that what happened to Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and he was mutilated in the battle of Fahad. And when Holy Prophet peace be upon him saw his mutilated body, the Holy Prophet peace be upon him was very emotional and he said, I will do the same with hundred of Quraysh in the next battle. But then Allah sent down the verses in Surah An-Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 126. In which Allah said, "Wain aqab tum fa aqibu bi mislima uqib tum bi, wala in sabr tum lahu wa khairul lis sabirin." If you want to take revenge, you can take equal revenge. Not hundred for one, you can do one for one. But Allah said, "Wala in sabr tum lahu wa khairul lis sabirin." But if you will show patience on it, and if you will not do the mutilation of even single body, that will be far better. And Holy Prophet was swear upon him was so obedient of Allah. That he said, okay, if Allah doesn't like it, I will not do it even for one body. So, Holy Prophet is here upon him and his uh, caliphs always ordered the forces that mutilation of the dead body is not allowed. Similarly, do not ill-treat the captives. Holy, you can give the example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him here. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, treated the captives of the Battle of Badr very nicely. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him ordered his sahaba to lose the ropes of the of the captives and the holy prophet peace be upon him said take care of their food and drink as long as they are with us and the companions were so obedient to the holy prophet peace be upon him that if they had some amount of food they used to give the food to the captives and they used to remain hungry or they used to eat the dates and the companions were, and the captives were so impressed by this behavior and by this treatment of the companions that many of them accepted Islam later. So ill treatment of the captives is not allowed in Islam. Similarly, it's not allowed to violate any kind of treaty which you have signed with the enemies. al harb Khuda'at, the battle and the war is the name of deceit. But if you have signed some kind of treatment, for example, if you have decided with the other party that we will not fight during the uh, hours of night, so you are not allowed to do any midnight attack because you have signed the treaty about it. But if you have not signed any kind of treaty like that, then you are allowed to use any tactic to destroy your enemy. But we are not allowed to commit any treachery, violation of the treaties and the commitments is, you know, not allowed. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu awfu bil uqood. O you who believe, fulfill all obligations. So we have to follow that command of Allah. Mujahideen should keep in their mind that they are not fighting to seize the land of the normal. That is not the purpose of jihad, as I told you earlier in the concept. And uh, the purpose is not to expand our territory, but the purpose to implement the law of Allah in that land. In the beginning, they used to come on the jizya taxes. Mostly, it happened in the time of the caliphs that they used to come on jizya taxes. But when they used to see the system of Islam, and when they used to uh, see the dealing of the companions with them and when they used to see the characters of the companions they used to get so much impressed that they used to accept Islam all those countries today which were conquered by the companions are Muslim countries even today why because they were not forced to accept Islam otherwise they could leave Islam much earlier they accepted Islam happily with their free will. That's why even today their generations are Muslims. So the purpose is to give guidance and the purpose is not to seize the land or to expand our territory only like all other, uh, the conquerors of the world, like Timur Lane and Chinggis Khan, Alexander the Great. All these people, they, they used to 
fight just to expand their territory. This is not the purpose of jihad and the, the Kalis did not do jihad for this purpose. And the main difference in the expansion of the other leaders of the world who conquered a large areas, you know, they, they just did destruction and they gave nothing to humankind. They used to destroy the towns. But caliphs, when they did jihad and when they occupied some land, they gave guidance to the people. They did a lot of development there. They brought their life of uh, the people living over there on a higher standard. So that's a big difference in the conquest of the caliph sahaba and the conquest of the other people. It is not allowed to put poison in the wells because obviously in this way many other people who are not taking part and who are not doing any resistance in the way of Allah, they will be suffering from that also. It's not allowed to poison the wells, to poison the food stocks. All these things which we discussed over here is called transgression. This is zulm. This is not allowed. The Holy Quran says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Fight in the way of Allah, those who fight you, but transgress not the limits. For Allah loves not the transgressors. transgressors. This is all transgression. So we must avoid all these kind of things. So this is the way we have to conduct the physical jihad. But to carry out physical jihad, there are some restrictions. We have to discuss them also over here. What are the conditions to do physical jihad? First of all, we should know that physical jihad will be carried out only on the command of the head of the state. The Khalifa will allow us only then we can do the physical jihad. Individually it cannot be carried out. It is not allowed that you read a book on jihad and you go out by weapon and you start killing the people in the name of jihad. This is not any form of jihad. Jihad can be done only in the leadership of the rightful caliph. During the caliphate of Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Muawiyah was asking Umar to give permission that we want to conquer the Cyprus island. He, Hazrat Muawiyah wanted to start the naval warfare but Hazrat Umar didn't allow. Then Hazrat Usman became the caliph. Hazrat Muawiyah asked Hazrat Usman for this permission. He allowed him to do that and then he carried out the naval warfare and he conquered Cyprus island. It's just example. That until and unless head of the state is not giving you the permission, you cannot carry out the physical jihad. And that is also a big problem today in the case of jihad. Because in Muslim states, the rulers and the leaders are not that Islamic. So the people, the mujahideen, uh, they start following their leaders. And they say that obviously the leaders of the Islamic states are not that uh, Islamic. They are... Uh, not uh, sincere with the Islam and with the Islamic societies. So how can we rely on them and how can we wait for their permission? That's why they start doing it in the, on the command of their own leaders. Secondly, we cannot phys do physical jihad without having a mir. Whenever Holy Prophet peace be upon him used to send uh, some of the troops to take uh, carry out jihad, he used to appoint some of the Amir on them. We know that Holy Prophet peace be upon him sent 3,000 Muslims to Muta, Battle of Muta took place. But Holy Prophet peace be upon him appointed Zaid bin Harissa as commander number one. In the case of his shahada, Jafar bin, Ab uh, bin Abi Talib will lead. In the case of his shahada, then Abdullah bin Rawaha will lead. So in this way, Amir will be appointed. And the people who will go will not be forced to go, but they will, be, they will go there with the free will. And this is about uh, jihad, which is for Zikifaya. Understand that there are two types of jihad. In most of the cases, physical jihad is for Zikifaya. For Zikifaya means that if some of the Muslims are carrying out this physical jihad and they are enough for that. So other Muslims are not required to go and uh, uh, take part in it because they are enough. For example, if we think about uh, uh, at our country level, our armies, our air force and our uh, navy is enough to defend our country Pakistan. So civilians are not required to go and stand on the border. In normal conditions it's surgical fire. I'm not talking about international at the level of 
international conditions of Muslims around the world, what Muslims have to do right now, the ulama can uh, guide us better. I'm just giving you the example of a country in Pakistan, for example, in the current situation, our armies and air forces enough to defend the country, so civilians are not obliged to go and stand on the borders. That's farz kifaya. But sometimes physical jihad becomes farz ain and it becomes for the end when non-Muslims attack on a Muslim state and such a big army is coming to attack that your army is not enough to stop them. And uh, in that case, it becomes for the end that every Muslim then is responsible to go and take part in it. For example, at the time of Tabuk expedition, when Holy Prophet peace be upon him got to know that the Syrians were planning to attack the Muslim territory, Holy Prophet peace be upon him said, all of you, will go with me. He made it farze ain and all men will go with me. Only the blind people and the handicapped people were excused. Otherwise, no other excuse was acceptable at the time. So, uh, you should keep in mind these two types also, farze kifaya and farze ain. Besides that, Holy Prophet Bishwi upon him said, this hadith is supporting the first point that without a ruler we cannot carry it out. Holy Prophet said, Jihad is obligatory on you only in the presence of a Muslim ruler. The Muslims who are living in non-Muslim states, they are not living under a Muslim ruler. So they don't have to carry out jihad over there. It is not any form of jihad that you are living in uh, some country, maybe in Canada or in some other country. And uh, you start killing the people over there in the name of jihad. Obviously, this is not any form of jihad. They trusted you, they allowed you to live in their country. So how can you violate the, the rulings of that country? So without having a Muslim ruler, jihad, physical jihad is not carried out. Another important condition for physical jihad is that we should have enough amount of people to start physical jihad. Why Holy Prophet peace be upon him didn't carry out the physical jihad when he was in Mecca? Because of insufficient number. The Muslims were too less in Mecca. They could not afford physical jihad with the Meccans. Meccans were at their womb and they were powerful and they could crush all the Muslim community there. So in Mecca there was a command to ignore and to remain patient and to not retaliate. That was a very very difficult command that the people are beating you for no reason and you are not allowed to fight back. The people, the Sahaba were even killed in Mecca, but they were not allowed to fight back. So because of insufficient number, if Muslims had started fighting against the Meccans, uh, they would have given them the justification to take action against them. And because of that justification, the Quraysh could eliminate all the Muslims in that community. That's why the command was there to be patient. Insufficient number restricts you not to announce physical jihad. But when the Holy Prophet is here upon him migrated to Medina, developed a Muslim community, increased the number of Muslims, only then Allah ordered them to now carry out the physical jihad. In the Holy Quran, Allah has commanded all Muslim communities to prepare for physical jihad. There is a verse in the Holy Quran in which Allah said, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمَّ سَطَعَةٌ مِّن قُوَّةٍ وَمِن رِبَاتِ الْخَيْلِ Prepare for them what you can afford from power and steeds of war. Steeds of war, Ribat al Khail refers to the horses which were trained for jihad, for fighting. But nowadays, what do we have to prepare for our enemies, for our defense? The tanks, the missiles, submarines, and uh, your radar system, and all these things which are used in the today's warfare, we have to prepare for them. It is the religious obligation on all Muslim communities to spend lots of money for their defense. Their defense should be so strong that the non-Muslims could not even think of attacking Muslim country. Nowadays in the Muslim world, the Muslims are in such a bad condition. One of the very important reasons is that they didn't follow this command of Allah. They didn't prepare well for their defense. In the Islamic world, we can say that properly there is only one uh, nuclear power, Pakistan, and all other Islamic states are not having enough technology with them, enough equipment with them or good trained armies with them so that they can defend themselves and it was a religious responsibility. 
Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, after the obligation of jihad, always encouraged his Sahaba to be ready for jihad. The companions and including the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, many a times didn't have anything to eat in their homes, but they always had swords and weapons with them for their defense. That is so important that Muslim states should uh, work for their defense, spend lots of money on that so that they can live independently with honor and with dignity and no other non-Muslim state should uh, even think of attacking them. So the, these are the important teachings of uh, Islam and the Quran about physical jihad. But there are rewards of jihad also. Look, there are two ahadiths. Hadith number seven in our syllabus is about jihad. I have discussed many of the things in my lectures. The videos are there in, uh, on the same uh, YouTube channel, Quranic Wisdom. We have to go through hadith number seven. And I have discussed the rewards of shahada. Uh, Matayadam in hadith number 8. So listen to those ahadith explanation also. Go through them with the handouts which I have provided you. So you will get some more stuff and more references from the Quran and Sunnah about physical jihad and about the people who get killed in the way of Allah during physical jihad. So this matter will be enough to solve the questions which come in CAIs. So I am finishing my lecture over here and inshallah see you uh, in the next lecture, uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow, you will be informed uh, through your WhatsApp groups about it. Allah Hafiz.